Greetings. Welcome to another edition of Montpelier Connection. This is one of our first shows during the COVID-19 crisis, and we're trying to get back on track and talk to the policymakers and people in the news here. Today, we have a special guest. We have Lieutenant Governor David Zuckerman. Good morning, David. Good morning, Mike. Nice to see you. Good. Good to see you. Um, David, uh, most people know, and I, I don't want to assume it, though, that, that you're a farmer. It's early in the morning, so I'm assuming you've finished chores for today. Well, uh, I've done some myself, and I've got a couple crew that come in to do do the pigs and uh, getting some plants started. Some of the crew are here, but yeah, I was up around five setting up the chick brooder. We had a new arrival of 275 uh, meat bird little yellow chicks, so we give them uh, fresh fresh shavings, clean water, uh, a good start with heat lamps, and I uh, went to the post office and picked those up at 6.30. And, uh -huh. and <laughs> Nicely nestled in today. Yeah. So I wanted to ask, as a farmer, um, diversified farming seems to be the future of ag in Vermont, at least a growing part of it. Can you tell me what kind of things you raise on your farm? Sure. I know that uh, actually your county, Wyndham County, is the most uh, diverse ag county in the state, uh, which is a nice little hallmark to have. Uh, obviously, I think we still want dairy to thrive and, and need to figure out how to um, remedy the, the multi-year challenges that they've been facing. Uh, but on our farm, we grow about 50 different uh, types of crops, maybe even 150 types of cultivars, because there's, say, three varieties of carrots and 12 varieties of tomatoes. Uh, but we also raise meat birds. Uh, we do this year, we're going to do about 1,300, uh, almost 1,400 meat birds. And we raise some hogs. We sell piglets in the spring, um, probably about 100 this year. And, uh, and we've got some laying hens, not as many as we'd like, but uh, we, we grow a range of things. We don't do any cheese or, or dairy uh, at this point and probably won't because we're pretty full busy. Uh, and we also grew hemp for the first time last year. And now we make some salve and uh, sell hemp flour as well. Yeah. Um question leads to a question that, that I get a lot. Can Vermont feed itself? Mm -hmm. Yeah, Bill McKibben visited my farm over 20 years ago when I was in the Intervale. And I said we can. We certainly have the land. We have the equipment. Uh, we have the ability. Uh, we would need a, a big shift in our, um, in our systems to do it, however, uh, because right now it would take far more labor than currently works on our farms. Uh, and we would probably have to import some more uh, vegetable or grain type equipment because we have a fairly dairy type equipment focused uh, situation. But as far as having the land uh, open and ready to be planted, uh, I think we certainly could, but it would be a transition. Some of those hay fields and corn fields would need to be um, a wider range of, of products. But we're seeing that experience and expertise grow in the state with some really innovative farmers and grains, uh, even rice farmer. Um, and then our extension agency is, is having a broader and broader set of knowledge. So if we had to on a dime, I'd say with one year notice uh, and, and we could get our hands on the seed, uh, if people were ready to get out there and, and work or volunteer to get that food grown, if we were in a, we need to produce our own food moment, uh, we could, but it, it wouldn't happen on a, on a flip yeah. of a dot. Now, uh, we've got some, as you said, some amazing growers down here in Wyndham County. Uh, people like Paul Harlow in Westminster, Jack Mannix in, at Walker Farm in, in Dumberston. Yeah, and point. one of the things they mention is we would need to boost our storage. That's absolutely right. Uh, that certainly to maintain food throughout the year we would need to be able to put it up, whether it's root cellars, whether it's canning, whether it's freezing. You know, we have some pretty big storage units on those apple farms, but when you actually think how much food we eat, I'd give you an example. Our farm, we're pretty excited in the fall when our three coolers and our warmer room are full, we probably have 100,000 pounds of food. And it's, a, it's mind boggling to look at that much food. But when I do the math, I live on the very edge of Chittenden County and Addison County. Uh, that's less than one pound of food for all Chittenden County residents for one day. And I'm not as big as Paul Harlow or Pete's Greens, but I think uh, according to the Farm to Plate survey, I'm in the top 5% scale. 
And so if I've got not enough food for, you know, a, a sixth of the population have one pound for one day uh, in storage, then that really, I think they're absolutely right. That is a massive pinch point and we would need to construct significant storage. So as we look to get our economy rolling again, especially ag, you know, as, as you mentioned before, dairy is struggling and, you know, dairy certainly has its challenges for a while there. Uh, last year, milk prices were finally up around $19, $20 a hundred, but now they've crashed and uh, we're looking to help people diversify. Is, is, is this the, the way to, to help the ag economy forward? Well, I think there's a combination of things. I don't know whether we try to differentiate Vermont's milk from commodity milk. Uh, we do that with our amazing cheeses and, and we've differentiated that, that value added product from other cheeses around the country and the world. We're getting awards from around the world competing with France for you know, the best cheeses in some categories. And uh, you know, I think um, our dairy can continue to thrive if we differentiate it, including our fluid milk. And if we put some parameters around uh, grass being a bigger part of their diet, live grass, field access, and worker conditions, I think there's a Southern New England market that would pay a premium that could reward our farmers for their work. At the same time, I think we have a real opportunity in diversification. Uh, this current pandemic is putting a big spotlight on what are the most critical and basic things that we need in society. And obviously food and healthy food is about as basic as it gets. And so this, this reliance on the global system, um, while it is a very good system, uh, I think we've tipped the balance a little too far in the ability to ship and move everything wherever we think we can around the world. And maybe we should build a little more resilience into our own local food economy. Yeah, well, getting the economy going is a big thing. Uh, any other ideas on what we can yeah. do to kickstart our economy? Well, I know right now um, there's the beginnings of the conversation between some restaurants, some food shelves, and food distribution networks uh, that I've been working with. Uh, and the Skinny Pancake was one of the first folks that did it. They're doing, I think, over 4,000, almost 6,000 meals a day is their plan yeah. uh, to produce and distribute uh, to people who are food insecure. And maybe, and this is a topic of conversation to figure out, with the COVID relief money, an expense created by COVID would be the need to deliver food to people. So what if the state were to buy, at this point, commodity food, because our farms don't have it, we're at the end of the storage season, but if they were to buy food in, give it to the restaurants who are larger facilities to then make meals and or can freeze and store food, and then the employees of those restaurants who right now have no jobs could be delivering those. And maybe the COVID money could also augment that pay because restaurant staff workers pay is a fraction of the minimum wage. And so the PPP money doesn't go far enough for that. So maybe there's a way to create uh, at least a short-term feeding program with, with the federal money that would put a lot of people back to work so that when doors started to open, those restaurants would still have their employees. Some restaurants could shift over, we could, we could sequence it, and the restaurants would have income uh, from this project to pay their other bills because we really don't want our restaurants to go out of business. There's a huge concern about that. Uh, then we have the opportunity with the unfortunate, obviously, situation around schools and unequal education right now in rural areas where broadband doesn't reach, teachers might not have good hookups, students might not have good hookups, and we certainly don't want to become reliant on a remote education system. I think there's so much more um, learning opportunity and socialization in the classroom and, and all the dynamics that happen, but certainly could pay a lot of people who have uh, either engineering or mechanical skills to run that fiber up and down the valleys and into the nooks and crannies of the state of Vermont uh, and not only get that education opportunity back up and running so that if in the fall this continues or re-continues, re uh, but also that would be a huge boost to the economic opportunity for people throughout Vermont to take advantage of uh, being able to bring high-skilled work into their home with yeah. clients in Boston, New York, Connecticut, just a few hours away, especially for you in the South, uh, where you know once a month, once every two months, they could 
drive a couple hours, meet with clients for two days and a night, and then live in Vermont for a month with their kids and their family. Or bring more people to Vermont knowing we have that infrastructure. Well, that's, broadband. that's right. That kind of job, that kind of lifestyle would be possible. And I think that could really help, especially Southern Vermont and actually up in the Northeast Kingdom where the you know 8991 corridor gets people pretty fast because uh, there's a study out there, a Harris poll that shows 39% of urban dwellers are rethinking whether they want to live in urban areas or move to rural yeah. areas after this crisis. And uh, it, we only need 5,000 or 10,000 or 20,000, which is a, a fraction of a fraction of a percent yeah. of the people in Southern New England. Yeah, it's, it's interesting that after 9-11, we had a, a, a similar bump. Exactly. Where people started looking to us. And then there's a, a lot of speculation that climate is going to, have people looking to a place like Vermont for a safe refuge. So we need to be ready for that. Can I touch on that for a minute? Uh, one of the things, being ready for that is a critical, critical point. Uh, we have had an economy that had been doing you know, pretty well with low unemployment, although half our state was living paycheck to paycheck. So for me, that's not the definition of a good economy, but we were doing relatively well. So we could sort of coast on that. And I think our administration did coast on that. But if you're thinking ahead and you're planning for the future, you've got to be doing more. And one of those is if there's a big influx of folks to Vermont from other places, if we already think housing is too expensive now, our housing market is affected by pure capitalist models of supply and demand. And people that are coming from Boston or New York or New Jersey, they can sell a, a 2,000 square foot home and up here can buy a 3,000 square foot home with 30 acres for less money. And so the, the, the affordability that the governor talks about for Vermonters, it's gonna be like a statewide gentrification. We're already seeing that. So unless as a state, we put in policies to really invest in affordable housing in our village centers and even perpetually affordable housing more than just straight up affordable housing uh, so that Vermonters don't get displaced by that migration with higher money, uh, then we're really doing Vermonters a disservice. And that takes planning, foresight, and investment. And that's part of what we need to be doing. Oh, well, I totally agree. And it touches on something I wanted to bring up as well. Uh, one of the things we've been burdened with that slowed down some of the work in the legislature is we've had to fight back against Trump policies where they've pulled protections for the environment attacks on women's reproductive freedom. Uh, when we have to backtrack and, and try and push back against Trump policies, we can't move our own agenda. But you make a good point. Now, when, I think the Times just released a, a list of 100 places where Trump has, has pulled back EPA protections for the environment. Um, hmm. in, in your administration, where's the place of the environment balancing those pieces you just mentioned? Well, I think actually it's, it's right up there. When I announced I was gonna run, uh, one of my top items is the climate crisis in our rural economy. And I think we have tremendous opportunity. You know, one of the things about Vermont that is great, but is also a challenge, is that we are one of the most geographically spread out populations of almost any state in the country. And so, Doing that means we have higher per capita mileage on our cars. Uh, it means that distribution of key goods or public transportation is more difficult. But if we were to invest, rebuild all of our village centers or invest, not necessarily rebuild, but build in those village center areas and have, you know, six and eight and 30 unit dwellings, you know, built into some of these village centers, you would have an economic opportunity to have enough people living in the area to have a coffee shop or a gas station again. You would, if you have good broadband, you would have people not having to drive the kind of mileage that people have to drive, which is both an environmental solution and it's a personal, like better life situation. If you have to drive 40 minutes each way to work every day, think how many hours of your life are spent in a car. Whereas if yep. you could work out of your living room or a, or a community uh, technology hub in each village center, maybe at the schools, you know, turn our schools into community centers that include a, uh, a health aspect and or uh, uh, agency of human services connection so that the schools wouldn't have to carry all the social service costs, but have that be on the broader tax base. There's a lot of ways that we can make our villages 
uh, really thriving that would allow the whole town to thrive in a, in a reborn kind of way, but in a climate conscious way. And part of the climate conscious way also includes our agriculture. We actually, across this country, the greatest opportunity to take carbon out of the air is through agriculture. It's through growing plants that breathe carbon dioxide. And instead of just burning those plants off or taking everything, put those cover crops back into the soil. Grow more no-till crops. There are ways that we can actually help the climate crisis fastest by really shifting agricultural production. And I think Vermont can be a model for that. And that also would mean we would have a value for our product because there are people out there that recognize that they have to put their money yeah. where their mouth is to save the environment. Yeah, and right along with those with that village development, um, I think the Transportation Climate Initiative would help us develop a public transportation system we don't have right now. And it's a little disappointing that this governor has been so um, reluctant to get behind the Transportation Climate Initiative. What's your thought on the TCI? Well, one of the things that has not been made clear is that if the TCI goes through in the general region and Vermont doesn't participate because the governor says we're not going to do it, uh, our prices of fuel are still going to go up because we are part of this regional cost system. And so the wholesalers aren't gonna suddenly, you know, figure out how to sell the Vermont trucks less costly fuel. So we're going to pay for it either way. But if we join it, we would actually get the receipts from it to be able to put back into the community. Now, I happen to think we should make sure those who are working class, struggling Vermonters, rural area folks, they ought to get a rebate or a deduction on their paychecks, so a, a deduction of the taxes on their paychecks so that they are made whole because it is a difficult tax for working class paycheck to paycheck people to pay. And so we do need to make sure they're maintained and whole, but it will still give us an extra chunk of money that we would be able to invest in things like public transportation or recharging stations or various other climate friendly transportation uh, alternatives and adjustments. Yeah, it's a, a win-win situation, I think for us, but you, you pointed out the challenge is how to make this so it doesn't feel regressive on working uh, Vermonters. That's a key piece for me, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Now, uh, David, I'm gonna switch gears a little bit here. Um, one of the other things we've had to push back hard against with the Trump administration is their relentless attacks on women's reproductive freedom. Uh, Vermont has consistently supported a women's right to choose, we trust our we trust the women of Vermont to make these decisions themselves, and yet in state after state, the Trump administration has organized efforts to put that put that aside. Um, where are you on this issue? Well, I've I've been a, a staunch supporter of women and women's reproductive freedom since before I can remember. Uh, my mom was a strong leader, and uh, actually did. Um, biochemistry work uh, back in the 60s researching women's endocrinology. So it's been a topic in my household since before, before I was ever in politics. Uh, and I've supported every <laughs> Wade resolution and each bill that we move towards uh, women's reproductive freedom, autonomy, as well as economic situations, because actually women don't make as much as men in the same jobs on average. And therefore, they're also not as well situated to be able to have the freedoms and autonomy that uh, some men have. But uh, ultimately, we've also just passed in the Senate, and I think you passed it in the House, uh, Proposition 5, which is to uh, enshrine in our Constitution those rights for women so that uh, no matter what happens at the federal level, at the federal courts and the stacking that Mitch McConnell has just done in an egregious way, uh, that we would be able to uh, protect women here. Uh, that may be another reason people actually consider moving here. Uh, is based on some of these just draconian policies of the Trump administration that have uh, really um, been such a step backwards for the progress we have been making, not only on women's issues, but like you said earlier, on the environment, on human rights, and so forth. And a fair economy. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the 
the Trump administration tax cuts, uh, they primarily benefited the wealthy. If you look at the Vermont supposed savings for Vermonters, it was about $500 million, of which the top 5% was about 250 million of it. The top 10% was about 350 million of that. And so, uh, you know, this trickle down theory of Reaganomics uh, that we've been living with for all of my adult life, you know, the past 40 years um, has clearly failed working people. And there's a reason working people are angry. I don't, I still don't get why they flock to someone like Trump in terms of for the solution, because it's the, the top down financial policies that Trump is the epitome of that has left working people stagnant for wage growth, while the upper middle and, and top class have grown and grown under this trickle down. I mean, the way I explain it is, you know, if someone already has a, a couple of houses and pools and nice cars, if you give them more money, they're not gonna buy another pool and put that in. You know, so this, this idea that wealthy people will create jobs by expanding what they have, when I look at the current situation with the direct payments to people under the stimulus plan, when people have money at the bottom level, they buy food, they pay their bills, they pay their rent, they pay their car payment. Well, that means the person that works at the auto dealer and all these different places, they get paid and then they get paid. So the money actually bubbles up far more through our society when it's down at the bottom than when it's inserted at the top it doesn't really trickle down. And, and we've experienced no. this for 40 years. We can't keep drinking that Kool-Aid and thinking it's gonna taste different. Yeah, well, you, you mentioned that, how we would do well to help people down at the lower levels. And one of the things we did in the legislature this year, or we tried to do, was pass a Paid Family Leave Act. This went through the Senate, uh, went through the House, uh, but the governor, does not support this. And at a time like this, it shows how important something like this could be. Now, where, where are you on paid family leave? Well, it's interesting. I, I would put paid family leave and, and raise the minimum wage in the same boat as far as the governor vetoing bills that would have put working people in a better position to weather this storm. Uh, when you uh, don't pay people enough that they can barely meet their basic needs, the minute the, the economy crashes, whether it's a, you know, 2008, whether it's a pandemic, uh, you know, no one could forecast a pandemic. I don't, I don't fault the scale of the situation at all on this governor. Uh, I don't think anybody can or should. However, in a regular economic downturn, our systems would have failed. Our UI system uh, didn't have the computer system and the resources to deal with it. I get that some of that's federally based in terms of how many employees are there, uh, but the, the ramp up of augmented uh, supplemental employees was very slow. I know that's a slight sidetrack, we can get back to that in a minute. But if we had paid family leave, the number of people that would have been immediately backlogged in the UI system would have been fewer because some of those folks who are trying to take care of their or protect their vulnerable family members would have had the opportunity to potentially use paid family leave as an economic augmentation for those first few weeks while the UI system was dealing with the backlog. If yes. you had a higher minimum wage, you know, 50 cents a year, an hour, is $1,000 a year more in someone's pocket. My understanding is the two-year raise that was going to happen, uh, that we actually finally, we overrode the governor, but uh, is about $5,000 over those two years. Well, he had already vetoed a minimum wage bill last biennium. So you add that on, how many people would be better off today if they had made yeah. two, three, five thousand dollars more in the last two years? Quite a few would have gone into this situation uh, less precariously on the edge. So yeah. these decisions have impacts, very real impacts. Yeah. And the reason for paid family leave is for unexpected events. That's right. That's a so, good point. And, um, yeah. David, we've only got a few minutes left here. Um, I just wanted to say I appreciate you taking the time. Of, uh, going back to when I first came into the house and, and you sat behind me in, in the house, I've appreciated working with you. And, and I just want to say that I look forward to working with you as governor. And I, I want to offer my support for your candidacy 
and and hope we can move Vermont forward in a way that that brings you and the the values that that you want to share with Vermonters. Uh, are there any last words you want to share with with the people of Windham well, County here? Well, certainly, uh, thank you for that. I do appreciate it, and uh, um, I also want to just say, you know, recent news broke that your district mate uh, Nader is not running again, which I think is really unfortunate. Uh, he brought a lot in this this one term. I think his his uh, wisdom and his breadth of knowledge and his his uh, measured thinking process and presentation were just really an asset for the building. And I, I hope uh, that there's an opportunity for him to return someday because your district really had a gem there, uh, along with you and of course his predecessor, uh, David Dean. But um, uh, so I wanna thank him. I wanna thank you for both the endorsement and of course the work that you're continuing to do. And I look forward to it. I think what we could do uh, with uh, a deliberative, thoughtful process looking towards the vision of, of Vermont and sort of the rebirth from this pandemic uh, is is really a, a unique opportunity that we could um, do amazing things with. Yeah. Well, well thank you, David. And uh, I'm sure we'll be seeing more of you down here in Wyndham County. And if anybody wants to visit, it's ZuckermanFORVT.com. And uh, you can get information about me. You can reach out to the campaign and learn more about what my vision is. You can, of course, contribute. Um, but Zuckerman for VT.com. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. And thank you to the people at VCTV for, for bringing this to the viewers down there. So have a great day. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye.